Hi, this is Beth from St. Louis, Missouri, writing Get Out the Vote postcards, and you are listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Hi, everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, and I'm excited today to have a rare in-person recording with Rebecca Sive, who is the author of Vote Her In, Your Guide to Electing Our First Woman President. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for joining me. It's fun to actually meet you in person. Likewise. So, Rebecca, you were on the podcast a while ago. It was quite a while ago now. I think right. almost a whole year ago. Mm-hmm. And we were discussing your previous book right. about women running for office. Maybe since we've picked up some new listeners since then, we could start with just a little bit of background. You know, sort of what what's your background and, and what led you to, to write this new book? Mm-hmm. Well, thanks. It's a treat to be here. And I've been watching you and I'm just thrilled with what's happening. It's like two broads. What a great idea. (laughs) Well, by way of background, I guess I should say I grew up in a political family. Both my mother and my father were involved. My father actually ran for Congress when I was eight uh, in a very Republican district, but he was a young man and a Democrat and committed to trying to make a difference. So I had a lot of political experience. I was uh, engaged in by the women's movement, I guess I should say, when I was in college and have been ever since doing a variety of women's issues, projects, and advocacy, primarily in the kind of political sphere on issues of economic justice and reproductive rights. And I've held public office. So with Every Day is Election Day, which was published after the 2008 election and and right after the 2012, I realized that times had changed because here was a woman, 18 million cracks in the glass ceiling, I think she said, who had run for president uh, in the uh, primary of a major party. And that was really the first time that had ever happened uh, in that way and to that degree of success. And so I thought, well, time for those of us who've been doing this for a while to share our stories and our guidance for how to run for office. So for that book, I interviewed about 30 women, a number of elected officials, also women who run large uh, public interest organizations like Cecile Richards. And the book is kind of chapter by chapter, you know, what to think about, how to do it. And I was pleased with the opportunity I had after it was published. I traveled all over. Uh, It's still selling, which is kind of a thrill. Well, there are a lot of women running and it's a useful book for them to have. But after 2016, I guess my uh, conclusion, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a variety of people who have points of view about why Hillary Clinton lost, although she won the popular vote. So the, the loss idea is kind of a misnomer, I would say. But for me, the fundamentals, if you looked at some of the data, had to do with sexism, that as one of the most, if not the most qualified people to ever run for the presidency, her qualifications didn't matter. And for instance, as I say in the introduction to Voter In, when I interviewed uh, Illinois Attorney General Lisa Madigan, she made that point. So I thought, well, we know how to do this. We need to do it again. And it's imperative that we do it soon, uh, given the kind of uh, president we presently have who is so anti-women. So that's what prompted me to write Vote Her In. And it's basically um, a two-part book. The first part is a manifesto. Here's the case. It's a case statement. The second part is how every woman can be involved, right? How every woman, no matter where she is, no matter where she lives, no matter her background, can be engaged in this campaign to elect a woman president, both individually and collectively. So that was kind of the impetus. And the official pub date is coming up in a couple of days and uh, begun celebrating in Chicago. And it's just been great so far. Yeah. And so the the book visually is really striking. It's really beautiful. Thank you. So I I hope people will will take a look at it. Uh, So you have all these great images of posters from the Women's March in 2017. 
And like you, I was at the Chicago mm-hmm. Women's March, which was... But I didn't see you among a quarter know, million people. Shocking. Where were you? <laughs> I tried to find a lot of people that I couldn't find <laughs> who were there. And it was, it was really, it was a life-changing day for me. Uh, and I think it was for yes. a lot of women. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about why, why structure the book around those, those wonderful images and, right. and sort of what the Women's March sort of meant for you. Yes. Well, thank you for asking. Like you, I the march was revelatory, was very a very deep experience. And uh, not because we haven't all expressed ourselves previously, perhaps been in marches, but the sheer number of women, the diversity of women, the energy, uh, the uh, commitment to change. And that's how the idea for using illustrations based on the images uh, on the posters came to me. I had decided before I went that I was going to photograph the march. I just decided I I want to record this and maybe I'll share these photos with my friends. Who knows? But I want to have this record. So I got there early. I went to a wonderful Planned Parenthood breakfast where there were posters standing around the the walls, and then walked out on Michigan Avenue. And I was out there, I don't know, for hours. Fortunately, I kind of saw a lot of people as I was going by. That was fun. And I photographed. And I then was so struck by the eloquence of just every woman, and also by the graphic presence of these posters. You know, some were hand-drawn, some were more elegant. A woman who's a gifted artist clearly had drawn that one. And so I took a look at the posters, and then it it took me a while, anything worth doing does, and certainly a book. I realized that those messages on those posters uh, told the story I wanted to tell. So as you mentioned, each chapter of the book is titled with an expression from one of the Women's March posters, and then the poster that had those words, an illustration based on it, is what opens the chapter. It, It just was great as an aside, uh, you know, to keep me going, looking at these uh, posters. And I do want to say thank you to the woman designer of the book, Morgan Crable, who just did an amazing job. She captured it. And when I asked her and my editor, Jessica, early on, are we going with the pink, which I happen (laughs) to love, but every book has pink. We sure are, but we're also doing these other colors. And so thank you. I, I think it it will help each of us, I hope, who who reads the book and who shares the book to feel energized. Other women are doing this. It's not just Rebecca, you know, a little voice in the wilderness somewhere, but this is, she's evoking here a group of us, a mass movement of us. Yeah, I was just looking at some pictures from the march. So there was a Twitter hashtag going around called We Are The Mob. That was about, you know, sort of taking back this narrative of, you know, liberal mobs are Uh are controlling and and showing what what this, you know, quote unquote mob of us really is. And these these wonderful, uplifting messages and and people, real people who are, you know, the ones who are taking to the streets. And yeah, those pictures are just it. They're so it it brings back that feeling of being there, of knowing that you were just surrounded by so many other people who feel so strongly Mm -hmm. about this and and want to support women. Yeah. And I, I think that's really great. And so that's part of what reading this book and seeing these pictures did for me is, is mm-hmm. yeah, is bring back that feeling of saying, yes, we are all in this together. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear you say that because I kind of, I've been, as I think about this, I've always been an advocate. I've done a lot of speaking. I kind of look at myself as the Pied Piper with this book. You know, I just want to be part of this long line of women who are, walking, marching, acting together. And we do need to be encouraged as we go. And I think the other thing about it I just would like to add is that it isn't only women who are famous or who are important, so to speak, who who make this happen. You know, it, 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 I mean, if you look at social movements of the past, if you look at the civil rights movement, for instance, yes, Dr. King and Malcolm X and other people were leaders and important leaders, and we cherish what they did, but they didn't do it alone. And while we're not people of that magnitude, we also know that we can organize and we can be with other people and find leaders who can compel us to act. So I'm glad to hear you say that the book um, resonated in that way, because that's what I want to do, because I think we can get down 
and we need to stay up. So I, I guess one of the, the other questions then is, you know, why, and this is sort of the first part of the book, but, mm-hmm. you know, why why do we need to make the case? You know, it, it seems so obvious in some ways, right. right? Of course we should have a woman president. <laughs> this is, a, you know, one of the, the only countries, uh, major countries, that, that hasn't had a woman leader. And, right. And so what sort of inspired you to think we need to make the case for this, that we we really need to have a woman president and, and it's mm-hmm. something that we need to not just – have as, you know, sort of a, a background idea, but instead to have as a, our explicit goal. To be paramount. Yes. I think I think a couple of reasons why I believe that to be the case. First of all, we are so we are only two years away from seeing that when a woman won, she couldn't win on the merits. And so we had never had that lesson before. So we want to do that uh, because it's the right thing to do. Women are as deserving and have the same right uh, to leadership positions as men do. And when there is clearly, in my view, sort of a discriminatory uh, behavior on the part of too many people about that, we need to fight against it. And you don't wait to fight that. You, you start marching and doing. Uh, The second reason is that the progress of women, whether it's into leadership positions or into good jobs that pay well or to wage parity, it's good, but it's modest. And what we know from looking primarily at women legislators is that they are the ones in legislatures who propose and get past uh, policies that do benefit women and girls. So given the extraordinary powers of the presidency, I have no doubt that a woman president would act similarly. So that's a very important reason to do this now. We're not moving along as rapidly as we should. There are only six women governors, for instance, of 50, of whom, as we speak today, before November 6th, four were elected. The legislatures, by and large, are somewhere, you know, between 20 and 25 percent female. If you look at the states, there is only one woman mayor among the 10 largest cities. Uh, Perhaps that'll change here in Chicago (laughs) in the near term. I certainly hope so. So uh, the third point here is that if we're going to have what's called representative government, we don't have the representation we ought to have. And I guess I would say one more thing um, about why now. There are now, you know, from the millennial generation to the boomers, I suppose four generations of women who are old enough to vote, old enough to be active, old enough to be in the workforce, old enough to be leaders in their community. And those women, if they're going to succeed in their own lives, uh, I think being part of a larger movement that arguably will change everything because we will see a woman, because girls will see a woman. And earlier this week and a couple of other talks I gave, I reminded people that uh, of the photo of the young African-American boy in the White House with President Obama, who, you know, asked the president to bend down so he could touch his hair. Right. And it's like it still gives me chills. And what is that about? It's about can someone like me be the person who sits in this office? So I say in the book, yes, she can. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And I I think it's an important point about women in executive offices, as you just mentioned, the the governorship, the mayorship. Yes. That we're seeing increasing numbers of women running for U.S. House. We've talked to many, many of them. Right, I know. (laughs) On our our podcast, Uh, you know, and and I think that's fantastic. And I'm really excited to see what women can do in the House, in the Senate. But this idea of women in charge in in the sole leadership position is something that a lot of people still seem to have trouble imagining. Well, they not only have trouble imagining it, when they do, they run the other way. So if you look at, and I say this in the book, and there's some data there, you can look across any institutional sector of American life. It's true in universities. It's true in businesses, philanthropy, government. The higher up the ladder you go, the fewer women there are. There's just an, you know, there is this glass ceiling or this cement ceiling or something 
the notion that a woman would be the person in charge as opposed to, for instance, in a legislative capacity among a group who work together to make decisions. And the other important point about that, of course, is that uh, at least in a government setting and also in other settings, that one person in charge has powers that the groups don't have, right? There are, you know, the president can issue executive orders, right? Mayors can, I don't know if that's the right word for them, but they have powers like that. They do the appointing of people. So if you're going to have a commissioner of a department, it's the mayor, say, who makes that decision. Well, let's have a woman head streets and sand or planning or economic development, not just consumer affairs or health and human services. So there are extraordinary, vitally important duties of people in these executive roles, uh, which is why I think having women in them is so important. Yeah, I think one of the many lessons of the Trump presidency, uh, for me at least, has been realizing just how powerful the executive branch is. That, you know, it was sort of in the back of my mind that, well, maybe the president isn't that important. You know, maybe yeah, it's just sort of a, a symbolic position. They don't do that much. And, and really, in fact, clearly have <laughs> extraordinary powers. Yes. And and you're right with the appointing of people. I mean, we see right now in, in Trump's cabinet, I think there's only at this point with Nikki Haley leaving four women maybe and, you know, and not in the, the highest, most right. powerful positions. So yeah, it seems clear that that is is one of the the many reasons that it would be so important to to have a woman. If you think about one other example, which just came up this week, the president appoints judges and justices. There are hundreds and hundreds of federal judges, if not thousands. I don't actually know the number, but apparently I saw a news item um, saying that the pres- president Trump appointed a number of nominated a number of people to federal judgeships earlier this week, all of whom are white men. So that's, you know, and judges have, as we know so well now that the Justice Kavanaugh chapter has been completed, they serve for a lifetime, subject to, so to speak, bad behavior. But that happens, you know, they're so it's just, and those courts are making decisions, right? Every single day, whether we're aware of them or not, that affect our lives on all kinds of matters. So you could even strip away everything else and only look at the judiciary and, and just say, wow, you know, time to have someone with a different perspective there, someone who understands that people of every color and, and gender can be federal judges. I I read an interesting article, and I can't even remember at this point what it was or when I read it sometime in the past two years, uh, but it it has stuck with me so much that women are more likely to rise to power in systems where it is their peers who promote them to power. So if you're in a system where the leader of the country is chosen by the other members of the their equivalent of Congress, that they see the hard work that women do and they see how important they are, you know, so like Hillary Clinton's peers in the Senate always said what, you know, how what a great leader she was, how what great work she did. But in a country like ours, we promote to executive positions people who are good at campaigning. So not necessarily good at doing the work of legislating or, you know, being in power, but instead people who are good at campaigning. And the way that we sort of judge campaigning is people who can raise money, people who can glad hand, that 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 sort of thing. I I wondered if, if you had sort of thought in those terms. I've thought about that, um, and I'm glad you brought it up. I I see it a little bit differently. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you look at the women in other countries, for instance, Indira Gandhi and Golda Meir and Margaret Thatcher, uh, three women prime ministers in the first generation of them in the world's history, they were, as you know, very gifted politicians. They did all the gland handing and fundraising and politicking one needs to do to be in a position to have their peers uh, select them as prime minister. So I do think that women need to be as smart about the politics as men. I don't think there's any evidence to the contrary. 
But it, you're right that in those instances where a woman is chosen as prime minister, she's not. it's not a direct election by the populace. It is a selection by a party. So that's a whole different dynamic in many ways. So I think that we can learn from them. I, As an aside, I tell you, I'm just now reading a biography of Golda Meir, and you know, it's published last year, a fantastic book. But wow, when you read what she and the other early women in Israeli politics had to do to be heard on women's issues, for instance. So I think that that's the, it isn't that they differ in their political gifts and ability to apply them, but in the manner of election. I do think that if you look at the U.S. and Hillary Clinton and Brazil and Dilma Rousseff, those are probably comparable uh, experiences worth studying. And I don't know enough about the Brazilian situation to speak authoritatively, but it, it does appear that she was treated badly, if not unjustly, and certainly Hillary was too. The countries are sort of equally large. There's direct vote for a president. They're uh, racially similar in ways that are important in terms of the issues. So I think that what we can take away from this is that helping as much as we can, you know, those of us who aren't going to run but are committed to this, as much as we can, those women who do have those political gifts, that intellectual and and emotional commitment to doing this work, and help them get out there, whatever the form of election is. So if it's appointed office, which is incredibly important, help them get there for that. Um, if it's elected, help them do that. If it's I'm going to volunteer to serve on this committee, and if I volunteer, I'll be picked. Help them have the courage to volunteer. And I guess I would just say on that note that, you know, there are something like a half a million public offices in the U.S., and many of them are executive, like county clerk or city clerk or village clerk. So there are all kinds of ways for women to be helpful to each other and hold these jobs and move higher up if they want to. Yeah. And so you segued now into sort of the, the second half, the sort of what do we do? How, how do mm -hmm. we get the, how do we elect the first woman president? And so I, I thought the recommendations you have sort of the, the checklist of things at, at the end of each chapter was so interesting to me that you started with a, let's just support women. Let's, you know, have a fun party with, with your, your women friends. I think I had maybe started to to think like, oh, we're going to, you know, check this box, this box, we're going to, you know, go find a woman to run for mayor and, and do that. Mm -hmm. And and instead, it, it's so much more basic in a way that, that we have to support women and, and be women and be friends with women first. Yeah, I, you know, I guess, number one, you can't do it alone. One can't do it alone. And how do you begin? How does one begin? You begin by... Uh, identifying or encouraging the people who might share your view and discussing with them what this view could mean, right? So that's sort of primary. And then what's also primary is understanding that while, you know, mostly highly paid men run these campaigns, it, it's the rest of us who do most of the work. We're the ones who knock on the doors. We're the ones who share messages with our neighbors. We're the ones who hold fundraisers. And yes, if they're going to write great literature for, hand, to, for us to hand out, that's super. But we have to hand it out. Otherwise, it's just sitting somewhere in a box. So I related to that is when you look at some remarkable recent political campaigns, the people who really sustain the energy, and that's true right now with all of these campaigns, are people who just commit, not just, are people who commit to these everyday acts. And so I really want, through this checklist, to empower women, I guess, to feel that these everyday acts can be theirs too. And to understand, and this also comes up there, that when they engage in those acts, they will be recognized, they will be thanked, they can rise into leadership positions. For better or for worse, I've been involved in a lot of campaigns, and it was, in the beginning, it was just kind of amazing to me. It's like, oh, Rebecca, you handed out 100 flyers the other day on your block. Well, let's talk. You must be a hardworking, disciplined person. We want you to do more. 
So before you know it, you could be running a precinct operation or doing community fundraising. So yes, I. there are other books for the candidates about how to run smart campaigns. But I will say, and I mentioned this in the book, that unless the professional people find ways of engaging and mobilizing and giving us the tools we need and going where we are. I talk about Michigan in the book and how Secretary Clinton was not there enough and lost by only a few votes. It was tragic. Showed up, I think, in Grand Rapids the day before. Well, how do those people feel? And then I happen to, I live in Michigan part-time and I know a lot of people there and I'm involved and they told me how they were begging and they couldn't get anyone to listen. And I don't blame the secretary for that and I don't blame those local workers. So I want people to, yes, have a party with your girlfriends, talk about what you can do. Yeah, you can go to the mall, but you could also do this or whatever it is. Yeah, and I, I think that's, you know, another another one of the things that's been so heartening in in the past two years, not just the number of women running for office, but the number of women I've seen personally in my life stepping up and and saying, this is unacceptable. We're going to help people campaign. We're going to, you know, be the ones out there, you know, we're the, the lawyers who are going to be at the airport making exactly. sure that, that that's a great that example. People are, are getting the legal services that they need. Mm-hmm. We're going to, I mean, with the nomination of Kavanaugh, I, I've been seeing my, my female friends saying, we're going to figure out who's training people to perform services that need to be trained in case things become illegal. And it's, right. it's this network of women saying, we are going to take care of and support women. And, you know, I I think that that's been really powerful. Yeah, the other part of it is that it's imperative that we focus on these national issues, as we were talking before about, you know, judicial nominations. But so much of how people live their lives is right here at home in their neighborhood. And so thinking about health care or child care or the quality of the school or the parks, and making sure that the people in government who are making those decisions are the right people. I saw a couple friends of mine who live in the UP of Michigan the other day. The whole county, which is several hundred miles square, has 9,000 people. Mm -hmm. So my friend Susan was telling me about how they've gotten involved. They hadn't previously. They retired and moved there. And, you know, they were sort of hardcore political organizers here in Chicago, And so she's spending lots of time working, collaborating with these women who've never done this work before in this county of 9,000 people in the UP about electing county commissioners who are women and who care about important family issues. And she said, it is so gratifying and everyone is so committed. I mean, that was just sort of crystallized, you know, what, what is possible and that this is happening everywhere. Yeah, certainly the women who I know who are running for state legislative seats, mm-hmm. local seats, everyone on their volunteer staff is women. It's, yeah. You know. <laughs> you know, there's one other thing I wanted to share with you on this point about executive office cuz mm-hmm. that you know that really is the focal point of this book. Uh, earlier in the week we did a I did a program with Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox and Julie Stash, who's the uh, president of the MacArthur Foundation, the first woman chief of staff to a Chicago mayor. And I have also been in public office. So we had this conversation about executive power and its importance. And the state's attorney made a really important point which I want to share, which is about recognizing, you know, there's all this work to do about policy and helping women and so on and so forth. But she talked so eloquently about the idea that when you are in such a position, whether it's in a county of 9,000 or 4 million, so eloquently about the capacity one has when one is in an executive position to push back to say, no, the way you're going about this decision-making is wrong, it's sexist, it may be racist, and that that's a power that an executive has. So while she may sit in a room around a table and listen and hear and evaluate, 
she can push back. And I think that's something else here that in talking about the importance of executive power, I want women to think about and feel uh, that they can also be in such a position. Very few women get to do that. And so, oh, well, it's not so bad. Let me live with it. Or, oh, it's my job. I really can't say anything. Or, oh, well, it's only men around the table besides me. And she she just really underscored the importance of using that position once it's attained, president of the school board, to assert the pushback, to say, no, I'm going to look at this with a gender lens. If you only bring me male candidates for this job, this was an example she gave, go back and make another list. Yeah, yeah, that's so important. And I think that crystallizes for me, you know, I think a lot of women who who do get into positions on boards, things like that, sometimes are are happy to not be at the top, are happy to say, okay, well, you know, I, I serve on this board, I'm doing the work. Somebody else can can be the the executive. Somebody else can can be the chair of this committee, and how important it is that that we step up and and take leadership positions. One of the things that about that is, for instance, I don't know these exact numbers, but by way of example, you know, women are moving onto corporate boards, and I think it's true that they're moving onto boards in greater percentage than into CEO positions. Mm. So that's exactly your point. It's not enough to be yet again in another group in which you probably are a minority. There's something else that needs to happen, right? And so, yes, uh, perhaps by extension, talking about the power of electing a woman president in vote her in, uh, women will say, well, how does this relate to my own life? In addition to my working on electing a woman president, I'm going to run for chair of the school board. My mother was the president of the school board in the little town where I grew up. She was the first woman to do that, kind of why I'm probably the way I am. But I did talk with her about it. This was back in the 60s. And, you know, she was kind of at pains to say, well, it worked out well. But she's a very strong person and uh, strong opinions and a genius. And I I said, well, I was never in those meetings. You know, I was in college, I think, by the time she was elected. But I can just imagine she did do what, what Kim Fox was suggesting. Yes, I'm listening here. Yes, we're going to discuss this. Yes, we're going to find a, a way to go. And if there needs to be a final decision made by a person... I'm the one with the power to do that. So more and more of those women will be amazing yeah, and important. Well, I suspect we could talk all day, but (laughs) (laughs) are there any sort of final points, final things you want people to be thinking about? Yeah. Thank you for asking. I guess there's one point that I, I spend some time on in the book that I think is important here. The, the country is in uh, some kind of an, economic crisis as well right now. Uh, You know, the middle class is getting smaller and smaller. Wages are stagnant. Jobs for people with low skills and low education have basically disappeared. The further down the wage scale you go, the more women workers there are. Uh, That's not changing. Uh, Women are segregated in certain occupations. So I think that I, I mentioned this to say that That's not a land where all people are created equal and have equal opportunity. And what I believe is that one remedy for that, we must find a remedy or we will, I think, descend into something terrible, worse than what we're in now. One remedy for that, I believe, is a woman president. She will look at those issues of economic security because odds are she experienced that economic insecurity herself. It's kind of like in the early years of the fight for reproductive rights and legal abortion. People were mobilized because women were mobilized. They did not want their daughters to have back alley abortions. So sometimes you're mobilized by the reality of your own life and the life of other people around you. And in this context, I think that economic reality deserves great attention by women who have any capacity and willingness to fight for something better. Yeah, and I I appreciated that in the book you talk about how, I, I forget the exact phrase, but I, that no woman is free until all women are free. Yes. And that that 
that that is so important and and that is something I've definitely been seeing recently is not just we need to promote women, but we need to be thinking very deliberately about women of color having equal opportunities to be in positions of power and that that that's such an important piece of it that we we shouldn't be exclusive in our trying to get a female president, but instead we should be very inclusive. Well, I think others have said this before. I say it today, but um, in these last couple of years, African-American women have shown the way. There's really no question about that. If you look at places where fundamental justice was attained in ways that we didn't expect it, if you, for instance, look at the state of Alabama and the election of Doug Jones, who voted against Kavanaugh. I'm old enough to remember George Wallace, you know, standing in the door saying, segregation now, segregation forever. So yes, we is every one of us. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Rebecca, thank you so much for, for joining me. And it's, it's such a treat to be able to speak with you in person. Oh, likewise. So I hope everyone will check out Vote Her In, Your Guide to Electing Our First Woman President. It's a terrific book. And, and get your hands on a hard copy because it's just beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast.